Good evening and welcome to ATV News. I'm Charity Pepazani with your top stories this Wednesday. In Zimbabwe, an adulterous woman who was caught having an affair scolded her husband with hot porridge. 24-year-old Afina Zoho from Mashingo was yesterday convicted and sentenced to 10 months in prison from the assault on her husband. Although the sentence has been suspended on condition that she performs 210 hours of community service. Earlier this month, Ms. Zoho was entertaining her lover when her estranged husband, Mr. Caesar Rantehira, came back to the home they shared. The court at Mashingo Magistrate heard that Ms. Zoho confronted her, her angry husband and threw hot porridge on, onto his face before fleeing. Mr. Rintara sustained first degree burns and was rushed to Nishara Hospital. Two children in Lusaka's Chunga compound have died after a car drove into, into the wall and crushed them. The two children were having lunch in their yard when a 21-year-old driver plunged into the wall. The children were immediately killed by the falling bricks and the driver fled the scene. Movi TV have more on this story. Ensuring that all motorists are licensed is one exercise that should not rest. Failure to keep a closer eye on this will result in two accidents like this. Two miners of Lusaka's Chunga compound have died on the spot after an unlicensed driver, Joshua Kapini, hit into this veranda hall, which subsequently collapsed and squeezed the deceased at the time they were having lunch. Ben, if we cry, mother to the deceased children has now been left with no child. Eyewitnesses who were also present at the time the bodies were taken to the university teaching hospital mortuary made the following revelations. And father, fine consignor, has lost trace of the driver who caused the accident. This accident, which has resulted into the loss of two lives, has been caused by a driver who has little knowledge about driving. This calls for more efforts to see to it that motorists are licensed. Anton Chamba, Movi TV News, in Lusaka. In Malawi, a five-year-old boy has been killed in a freak accident as an excavator tractor accidentally buried him alive. On, such, on Sunday, a tractor from the Unitrain's haulage company was working along the Dwanga River State. Five-year-old Edwin Banda from Njolo Village was playing with his friends nearby when the driver accidentally pushed a large heap of sand over him, suffocating him. Edwin was rushed to Mukiti Health Center, but was pronounced dead at the scene. Nkunga police have warned parents against allowing children to play near tractors working at the Dwanga River to avoid tragedies like this one. A 27-year-old man in Lusaka, Zambia, has developed a rare, con rare medical condition which has resulted in the development of breasts. The, the resident from Mutendera Township, only known as Alfred, says he was shocked by the development on his body. Alfred said his condition apparently started after he took some antiretroviral drugs. Health Deputy Minister Dr. Patrick Chikusu has said the growth of breasts on males is not strange. Dr. Chikusu says the condition is known as gynecosmatia and develops in about 50% of men at some point in life. He has however stated that the condition should only last 6 to 18 months, but if it continues, the breasts can be surgically removed. 
Entertainment news now, and hundreds of music fans were left disappointed when dancehall star Lady Squanda failed to show up at her own gig, citing period pains as, as the reason why. The gig at Chitanguiza Aquatic Complex was meant to celebrate Lady Squander's 21st birthday with artists Rick Fire, Freeman and Gopsy Warrior all performing. After her no-show, Lady Squander's husband and manager Leroy Parsi explained that it was in fact severe period pains that, she, that had meant she could not perform. But the concert organizers, Punchline Entertainment, accused Squander of, of lack of professionalism for failing to tell them that she could not perform. Zambian singer Jonto has always been known for his R&B music, but now he's also influenced by gospel and the message of God. He joins me now from Lusaka. Thank you for joining us, Jonto. So where does that name come from? Um, when I was growing up, I used to play basketball and I was pretty good at it. Uh, when I reached my 12th grade, I was actually captain of my team uh, in Nola at the school coach for secondary school. And I was, I was also playing for a club that was called Bank of Zambia Celtics at that time. Um, now, at the club, at the club, club level, we had a lot of tall guys, very, very tall guys. But we never went for the ball. I mean, when it was, I mean, when I went for a rebound or I went for a layup and there were taller guys with me, I would always jump higher than them and I'd always come down with the ball. So they would say a John talker, meaning she, she's jumping or you, you know, you, you jump higher than everybody else. And they started calling me John Talk from there. I actually didn't like the name. I almost beat up someone for calling me that. But uh, afterwards, um, there's nothing much I could do. Everybody was calling me that and uh, I just took the name. And this time I was at the studio when I started recording music and uh, I just mentioned the name John Toe in the song and that's how I kept the name. So it's a nickname actually. So how best can you describe your music and who were some of your influences? Um, my music is uh, Zambian contemporary music. It's contemporary music and I've been inspired a lot by Arcade. I used to listen to a lot of arcade when I was growing up and uh, boys to men. So arcade is my number one, he's my number one man. I'm actually his number one fan. And um, I like boys to men as well. Um, locally, I like I like Exa, though we started seeing almost at the same time. But his music came out earlier, though we met in the studio as we both were recording our first albums. Um, he, he also inspires me a lot uh, in Zambia. I like the way he writes. And uh, though people say we kind of sound the same, that's what they used to say then, but now I'm sure they've seen or heard the difference. Okay, so what kind of challenges do Zambian musicians face? Well, um, I think uh, we, we don't have a promoter can actually promote music internationally to the highest level. Um, if you look at our music now, or if you listen to our music now, I think we've got, I mean, as Zambians, I mean, Zambian artists have got a lot of music which is actually of high quality and better than most of the music that you hear in the African continent. But then it comes to distribution, the distribution network and the promoters, I think, I'll promote, we don't, we don't really have promoters in Zambia, we don't have someone, there's nobody who can actually check, check out the music and really give it a punch that it deserves. Though so a few times here and there, you've got one or two artists who are going to have a song play on channel or play on MTV base, but it still doesn't go that much. I mean, we need, we need promoters, we need people who, can, who are going to be able to, you know, take our music out there. And other than that, we need people who are going to be able to actually push for shows which actually pay enough money when, it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when we talk about performing in other countries and uh, both in Africa and uh, other continents. You have a new song at the moment, Alequita. Is it okay if you just tell us a little bit about that one? My, I think my last album, you know, I've got three albums to my name. The last album, I think I released in 2009. Um, after that album, I haven't actually released a song or any albums. I've been quiet for some time. 
and that's because I've been trying to I've been trying to find myself to like to really know who I am. I, I mean, Jonto is there, Maiza is there, but I thought somewhere along the way there was something that I was missing, and there's something that I need to find about myself. And um, this song actually preaches to me as well. It ministers to me. I actually wrote the song to try somebody out there. But I actually found that after singing that song, after recording the song, whenever I play, it's like I'm talking to myself at the same time. But the song actually ministers to me. It's actually a gospel song. Um, unlike all the songs that I've been releasing, all my albums, this one is actually a gospel song, which talks a lot about, you know, God being there for you, God being the answer. And finally, John, so what can your fans expect from you for 2013? Well, 2013, I'm coming out with a bomb. And uh, 2013, I'm bringing out not only me, but um, I'm bringing out what the Lord is telling me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say I've turned so holy all of a sudden, or I'm trying to become a pastor or anything. But what I can say is that we only live once, and I think each and every song that I'm going to release in 2013, which is actually going to be good, there's going to be something that's going to be imparted on it uh, through me, from God. Thank you for joining us, John Tor. That was Zambian singer John Tor. But here now with the gospel on English football is Liam Thorp to talk about the midweek games. Thank you, Charity. Well, there were in fact two games to tell you about in the Premier League last night. We kept you updated on our ATV Facebook page that new QPR manager Harry Redknapp took his side to Sunderland where they battled hard and will be very pleased with a nil-nil draw. It wasn't the most exciting game, but they'll take a clean sheet because QPR have really struggled to keep clean sheets this season. So the new boss will be pleased. And in fact, if striker Jibril Cisse had been more efficient in front of goal, then the London side could well have won this match. Either way, things look a bit brighter for QPR. In last night's other match, Belgian striker Christian Benteke scored a late winner for Aston Villa as they beat strugglers Reading 1-0. The win takes Villa out of the relegation zone but leaves Reading just second off the bottom and they look like they're in real trouble. Villa manager Paul Lambert left star striker Darren Bent out of the squad for the second game in a row and TV pictures showed the striker not looking happy. But his replacement Benteke proved his worth with a headed goal late on, giving Villa a much needed victory. Well, tonight there are eight fixtures for us to look forward to, and we'll start with the table toppers. Manchester United entertain West Ham at Old Trafford. The Red Devils, of course, shot to the top spot after a 3 1 win against QPR at the weekend. Again, as is so often this season, they came from behind for that win. West Ham, they've had a great season so far, they currently sit in eighth position. They lost a tough match against Spurs at the weekend, but it, as I say, it was a tough match and they will have been buoyed by the fact that new, goal, new striker Andy Carroll scored his first goal for the Hammers. All that being said, United really should win this one, although, as we know, it may take West Ham to score first to really get the Red Devils going. Well, what about Chelsea? They host Fulham tonight in what is a South London derby. It's been well documented that new Chelsea boss Rafael Benitez got a frosty reception from his own fans in his first game out. So, he will be hoping to win them over with a win over their rivals and neighbours, Fulham. Fulham lost their weekend game against Stoke, but with in-form striker Dimitar Berbatov, they do have a player who can cause Chelsea a real load of problems. He's a great player and he can always get a goal. That all being said, the Blues should still win this one. Arsenal have probably the trickiest game of the Big Four tonight as they travel to fifth place Everton. The Gunners struggled against Aston Villa on Saturday. Of course, we mentioned on ATV they could only manage a nil-nil draw and they really looked out of sorts. Everton, who've had a flying start to the season, have also struggled a little recently, failing to beat Minnows, Reading and Norwich when they really should have won both of those games. But they welcome back their star player, Belgian Marouane Fellaini, and he could well inspire them to a win over the Gunners. Finally, what about the champions? Manchester City. They travel just up the road to nearby Wigan Athletic tonight. We're going to have had a pretty decent season by their standards and they can play good football at times. But it's hard to see even the most ambitious Wigan fan 
to see them getting anything out of this one. Man City, as we all know, have not been at their best this season, but with forwards like Tevez and Aguero still on scoring form, they're always likely to get a few goals and they should win this one quite comfortably. All right, so Liam, all the big teams are in action tonight. Who do you think has got the toughest challenge? Well, there's a few tough challenges for the big teams around, but as I just said in my piece there, Arsenal have probably got the hardest game. They go to Everton and they've really struggled away at Everton in the past. Most teams have, to be honest. They're very good at home. As I said, big players like Fellaini coming back. I really can't see them actually winning this game. And I think if you go to Everton, you play well and you get a draw, then, then you're happy with it. And that shows the standard that Everton are playing at the moment. And they are in fifth place and they thoroughly deserve to be there. Uh, United, they really should win comfortably at home against West Ham. But their season has been so up and down. They've, they usually let teams score first, but then they come back and hit them. Um, I can't see them losing that game with that being said. Man City, again, Wigan's not an easy place to go, but when you look at the squad they've got, there's no way they should be losing that game, but Wigan it will give it absolutely everything, but I still, again, I think City will, will win that one. And the final game is Chelsea and Fulham. That's probably the second toughest game for the big four, because Fulham are a decent side, and Chelsea, as we know, have got real, real problems at the moment with their new manager. The squad don't look up for it. There's, there are some rumours of infighting and people not being happy. So I'd say overall, I think the two Manchester sides should win easily. Um, Chelsea will be an, an interesting one. And yeah, Arsenal have Arsenal got a really tough game tonight. And as we get into the winter, how do you assess the season so far? It's, well, it's been a pretty typical Premier League season in terms of tons of goals, teams doing better than they should do, other teams doing a lot worse. You know, you look at teams like Liverpool and Arsenal and they're, they're down, much further down the league than they really should be. But as, we, as you say, we're getting into winter now and the league's starting to take that familiar look where the big teams start to pull away the two Manchester teams. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a two-horse race between them two. But uh, we discussed, me and Michael at the weekend, West Brom. There is usually a surprise package in the Premier League and they're most certainly the surprise package this year. I mean, they've played absolutely amazingly. They're sitting third place. It's just remains to see how long that will happen. And the other team to mention is West Ham because they just got promoted last season and they're, they're in eighth, so they must be delighted. Um, but it doesn't look so good for the other two promoted sides. I think they'll probably be heading back down. And finally, I believe you have some breaking news about the future of the Champions League. Yes, I do. This is a very interesting one, news just coming into us, that there are proposals in place that the, the Champions League, which is the premier European club competition, of course Chelsea won it last season, which currently only has 32 teams in it. The plan is, potentially, to extend that to 64 teams, which would mean scrapping the secondary competition, the Europa League, and therefore, so from England you'd have seven teams going in, from Scotland you'd have five teams going in, and obviously it'd be a much bigger competition. The, the reasons given for this is that the Champions League is a far more lucrative competition, and some people are complaining about the amount of games in the Europa League and actually saying it's harder. So it's an interesting one. As I say, it's early days. It's Michel Platini, the president of UEFA, has said it's early days and they are discussing it and the decisions should come in 2014, but it will completely change the outlook of the European competitions. So we'll, uh, we'll keep tabs on that one. Thanks for that, Liam. Well, we finish with today's picture of the day and it comes from Owen Moranguiri, who, who is proving that a dog really is men's best friend. Keep those pictures coming in, guys, and we'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Good night.